Is coffee actually good for you? Should we all be starting our day with a cup or have most coffee drinkers just become addicts who simply need it in order to function? Coffee is currently reaching a 20 year high. In the United States, 67% of American adults drink it every single day. It's a 40% increase since 2004. But is it a good thing? Today I'm gonna to break down and we're gonna look at the pros and the cons of coffee according to the science. Find out once and for all if you should be drinking it. Let's go. So first out of the gates, a pro, alertness. Let's start with that obvious pro coffee wake you up goodness that so many people experience. It's probably the biggest reason why people drink coffee. But interestingly, coffee doesn't actually give you energy. Instead, the science behind it is it blocks what's called adenosine. This is the chemical in your brain that actually makes you sleepy. So your brain doesn't get the adenosine message. And you typically feel the effect of that blockage within 10 to 15 minutes of drinking it. Now, you think you do right when you taste it, but it usually takes 10 to 15 minutes. And that's just the taste in your brain remembering, here comes the coffee within 10 to 15 minutes. Now, that effect peaks around 45 to 60 minutes. And it can last anywhere from three to eight hours, depending on how quickly your body genetically gets rid of the coffee. And it's your sensitivity, it's your metabolism. That's what determines how long that stays into your system. But that's what's going on. It's that blockage of adenosine. To note that caffeine doesn't stop the production of adenosine, okay? It's just a dam that holds it up. And when it wears off, you get that extra sleepiness or a crash because all the adenosine lets loose. So the dam breaks, adenosine comes back into the brain. If you're not drinking quality enough coffee, or maybe if you're drinking way too much of it, then you get a bigger crash. Now, heavy coffee drinkers have more adenosine receptors, which means you build up a bigger tolerance, it takes you more and more caffeine to get the exact same effect. So that's, we're all just sort of built differently. Now, on the con of this, this side of things, that pick me up, that sort of energizing effect that we get, for some, the con could be anxiety. While blocking adenosine triggers energy and helps improve focus, it can also trigger that fight or flight response in some people, depending on how sensitive and how your body responds to caffeine. In one study of people who experienced panic disorders, more than 50% of them experienced panic attacks after consuming caffeine versus only 1.7 of adults who didn't experience panic attacks having that sort of fight or flight response. The quality of the coffee can make an enormous difference here of having those jittery feelings. So some people though are triggered a bit more and caffeine can also increase cortisol levels. That's the stress hormone. For some people, those symptoms are increased heart rate, kind of that jittery or trembling, muscle twitching, difficulty concentrating. Those are just some of the symptoms that can show up if your body's really sensitive to it or you're drinking overly caffeinated or poor quality coffee. One eight ounce cup of black coffee typically has 100 or 200 milligrams in it. That's half of the FDA's maximum recommended amount in a day, which is 400 milligrams. So depending on how strong you're making your coffee is gonna determine how much to drink. And I'm gonna talk to you about the benefits of how much to drink. If we go beyond that, you're asking for more cortisol, more jitterness. So if you're sensitive, go easy. Increase the quality. Fermented natural bean roasts significantly increase the amount of antioxidants and they can help fight and reduce the jitters. So that makes a big difference. Now, let's go to the second pro, weight loss. Caffeine can increase metabolic rate anywhere from three to 11%. Burn a lot more calories, start your day with some coffee consumption. That process starts within 15 minutes of the consumption. It can last for several hours. So you're cranking up your metabolism during that time. You can even see as high as 29% increase in the metabolism function in leaner people. How? It works through thermogenesis. That's the production of heat in the body. Coffee drinkers can burn 80 to 150 more calories per day because they're stoking the fires. Now, caffeine also suppresses appetite. It reduces your daily caloric intake. That's why I like to use it as part of dirty fasting. When you're abstaining from eating solid food, maybe it's intermittently in the morning, or you're only eating one meal a day, or you're on a one or two or three day fast, using coffee as a replacement is not spiking insulin levels, which is key. It is also suppressing appetites. You feel satisfied even though you didn't have food. 
and you're stoking the fires of your metabolism. I love using it in that form. I love it for fasting because a cup of coffee has one calorie. So you're not throwing your body off if you are doing a little bit of rotational eating slash fasting. All right, let's go back to the con side, insomnia. Coffee keeping you awake can become a huge problem. In fact, a study found that 200 milligrams of caffeine, it's about two cups of coffee in the morning, still could reduce some sleep quality at night despite being metabolized before bedtime. So you've got to know if you're struggling with a lot of sleep issues, decreasing the amount of caffeine in your system and make sure you're really focused on the quality of the coffee so you're metabolizing it faster. It can also change your sleep cycle so that results in less deep sleep, which is critical for feeling refreshed. And it can also turn into a vicious cycle. Caffeine results in poor sleep, causes you to be tired, then people drink more coffee, and then you can't sleep again. So if you're really struggling with sleep, you might consider downgrading there a little bit. Now, it's super important to try to avoid caffeine in the afternoon, especially if your metabolism takes eight hours to metabolize it. My dad was that way. I'm not that way, but I try not to after 12 or one o'clock to have coffee so it doesn't mess with my sleep. If you follow that rule, most cases, majority of cases are gonna be good. Now, what we're gonna experience on the pro side, let's go back over there, is performance enhancement. When coffee blocks adenosine receptors, it increases the production of adrenaline, which increases energy. It improves blood flow to our muscles, to our heart, and it activates your central nervous system, the most important system in your body running everything. Coffee can boost athletic performance from three to 16% and improve circulation by as much as 30% during exercise. So how do you use it? Just takes a moderate amount, 60 to 90 minutes before your exercise regimen, you'll get a boost with performance while you're working out. In fact, it was so powerful that it was once banned by the International Olympic Committee and it was limited by the NCAA of people using caffeine to really get the most out of their performance. It also boosts cognition. So this is where it shows up for your work performance, your processing speed, your visual motor coordination and attention improves by 11%. A little coffee so you can pay attention to Dr. Living Good. In coffee drinkers, that's what goes on. Now, heavy coffee drinkers, five cups per day, they were found to have a cognitive age 6.7 years younger than those that drank a cup or less. Let's go back to the con side. Increased blood pressure. After around two cups of coffee, most people experience an increase in blood pressure for about three hours. Your systolic blood pressure can go up about eight points, diastolic by about five. And so timing really matters here. In fact, drinking coffee in the first hour after you wake up can raise it even further. However, it does eventually come back down. That effect wears off. It is not shown to chronically raise it. Just know during that period of time, you're gonna raise it. Now, the long-term effects are interesting. Studies show that healthy people who drink three to five cups per day have the lowest risk of cardiovascular disease, 15% less than people that don't drink coffee. So surprising. Now, if you have a significant hypertension issue, a blood pressure issue, and you're putting in two, three, four, five cups of coffee, you can increase the cardiovascular risk because of the severe hypertension and coffee's adding to it as opposed to fixing the cause. So something to note. So if your blood pressure is really high, consider passing on coffee or doing lower quality amounts until you get it brought down. Now let's go back to the pro side, antioxidants. Coffee is the number one source of antioxidants in the United States' diet. Coffee contains over 136 bioactive compounds. Most of those are antioxidants, way more than even a superfood like kale. Antioxidants are super important because they fight oxidative stress. So many diseases get heavily influenced by oxidative stress. So for example, for every additional cup per day of coffee that you drink, it reduces your type two diabetes risk by 6%. Drinking three to four cups of coffee per day reduces the chance of stroke by 21%. Drinking three to five cups of coffee per day can reduce Alzheimer's risk by as much as 65% shows the studies. Drinking 3.5 cups per day in studies resulted in a 15% lower risk of all causes of mortality. Now, different types of coffee have different types and levels of antioxidants. Like espresso, it's concentrated, has an 8x increase in the amount of antioxidants in it because you're concentrating that dose compared to say an Americano that's more watered down. 
Also, coffees that come from Colombia, Australia, Peru, they have higher amounts because of their soil. And fermented coffee, the way that the bean and the pits, the cherry, is extracted from the fruit that is around the coffee, the way that it is extracted can impact the antioxidants. That's why I like a more natural approach instead of washing it or using chemicals to try to get the fruit off of the coffee cherry, just allowing it to dry naturally in the sun and ferment. You get more of those antioxidants in a food that's able to bask in the sun and pull those nutrients out, fermenting that process of furthering the antioxidants. Plus, you can go another step and add superfoods to your coffee. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the benefit of coffee here with antioxidants is it doesn't even have to be caffeinated. Decaf has very similar effects. Just make sure that it's Swiss water processed so that they didn't use chemicals to wash out the caffeine. Swiss water process protects from that. Let's go another con, dependency and withdrawal. It only takes two to seven days of coffee consumption to develop that dependency. Now tolerance builds up and it happens even in the first month. Usually in the first week or two of drinking coffee, you're getting the full effects of caffeine. In weeks two to four, the tolerance becomes a little more noticeable. You're a little bit less sensitive to it. And then by week four, you've now settled in to your complete tolerance, whatever that level is. At that point, you start needing a little bit more caffeine to get that same type of functional change. And you could start to see the foggy feeling in the morning before you actually get your coffee. Now with quality coffee, I don't experience this. The reason that happens is coffee constricts blood vessels. When caffeine is removed, they expand and that can create some pain or begin even a little bit of fogginess. So that's what's going on in the brain with it. Now, other symptoms of withdrawals, fatigue, irritability, difficulty concentrating, depressed mood, anxiety, nausea, onset of these usually start to happen within 12 to 24 hours. It could take up to nine days to completely cut yourself off of coffee and get your brain reset back to non-reliance. So the big question there, Dr. Living Good, which is it? Is coffee healthy? Yes. It can literally extend your life. Still, there are certain people that just need to be aware of its effects. If your blood pressure is really high and you have severe hypertension, probably not the best food to be getting in. There's other forms of antioxidants, which we'll talk about in a moment, that you could be focused on. If you're pregnant, not the right time to be loading up on coffee. If you have a lot of insomnia issues, you should probably cut back and drink earlier in the day. If you have lots of anxiety issues, then you wanna be careful of not overdoing it. So how much should we drink? For the healthy adult, the research sweet spot is right around four cups. Going too much more than that doesn't show the health benefits and can kind of push you beyond the amount of caffeine in your system and really make you jittery. But around three to four cups is where you're getting the most benefit for your brain, for your heart. Try not to drink it too late in the day. And the best way to drink it Go dark, go more black. If you're going to use any kind of sweetener, I recommend stevia or monk fruit. I use my collagen where it's sort of a creamer without dairy and I'm getting the monk fruit in there. That's the way I tend to sweeten it if I'm going to. You can use cream, just make sure there's no antibiotics and no hormones in that cream. So buy a quality half and half if you're gonna use it. The more conventional processed dairy is gonna introduce a lot of chemicals and it can impact the antioxidant activity of the coffee. Avoid the fancy drinks. Anything that's light or sweetened, or if you're looking at lots of sugar added to it, it's diabetes in a cup very quickly. When you go to you know these coffee chains and they end up just making you a sugar bomb and that's actually dessert in a cup. It's not even coffee at that point. Add in water, drink water in between cups, drink water after, keep yourself hydrated. Even though coffee adds hydration to the system, it will speed up your body's processing of the liquids in your body and it will make you go to the bathroom a little bit quicker. So you just wanna make sure you're putting in some hydration after you're done drinking it. That's a practice that I always do. Make sure you choose the right kind of coffee. Shade grown, which means if they clear cut all of the trees, you eliminate the places for the birds to perch that are going to protect the coffee as it grows, as the cherry grows, because they're gonna eat the bugs that are gonna eat the crop. So when they clear cut, what they do is they eliminate the natural predators of the shade, shade grown, and they have to use pesticides and herbicides. And so you're getting a much more chemically laced coffee at that point. 
shade grown, non-genetically modified, and then someone that has lab tested it for mold, mycotoxins, and those pesticides. And then ideally, as far as the processing of it, we don't want chemicals involved. We mentioned Swiss water process for decaf, but there is a natural fermentation process that allows the cherry and the fruit to ferment in the sun, and then you get the cherry off of it, you're getting more antioxidant kick from that, and you're getting less of the chemicals use. This is going to allow a lower inflammatory risk in the body, so I like to have it more naturally fermented and shade grown. Then you can always upgrade your cup by adding superfoods. This is one of my favorite health hacks. The number one superfood in the world that is also high in antioxidants, that has 92 different nutrients, 20 vitamins, 18 different amino acids, 46 total different antioxidants, 36 compounds that support healthy inflammatory responses, Moringa. It's called the miracle tree for a reason because it comes with all of those touted nutrients. It is one of the, if not the most nutrient dense plants, foods, on the planet. It leads to direct energy boosts in a clean way, not with caffeine. It gives the antioxidant boost and it is a cup of nutrients. You can add it directly to your coffee. Now, if you take powdered Moringa and add it to your coffee, it's going to be like mixing green tea with coffee. It's gonna mess with the taste. Even if you add liquid version to it. So what I did when I created my coffee, I sourced shade grown, fermented, processed, low acid, mold tested coffee and found that we're protected them from the pesticides and the herbicides, we're protected from the mold. We're not getting a sour stomach after we drink it. It's got high antioxidant content. It's gonna prevent from those jitters and it's gonna taste full of flavor because of that fermentation process. And then we added Moringa in that is tasteless, but you're getting the benefits of Moringa in the coffee put together the two most powerful sources of antioxidants, the number one source for Americans, combined with the number one source of the world in your cup. You can check out more of that below of what I put in my cup every single morning. I love coffee, I do use it. There's a couple of things to be aware of with your sleep, anxiety, and blood pressure. However, it's a great source of antioxidants. It really does help performance and it can be used at a very beneficial health tool. So. If you want to learn about another superfood that you can actually put in your coffee, watch my other video on the number one superfood to transform your heart health. I love utilizing foods to our benefit because I really do believe it is the medicine that a lot of us are missing and needing. We just need to figure out how to get more goodness into our day in a convenient way. In that video, I explained to you how this ancient food has been used for hundreds, even thousands of years. It's better than both heart health medications and Viagra as far as its impact on the body. And the best part, it tastes like dessert. So I'll include that link to that video here. Click here to watch it and I'll see you over there.